the profound philosophical insight that a thing, in order to exist, is radically open. What is existing or continuing or persisting, it just means being in difference from oneself. Existing thus is futural, it is not yet. Consider a poem. Its meaning is its future. At some point, we will read it and decide on its meaning. Then we re-read it and another meaning might emerge. The only reason we return to a poem is that it might release a different meaning this time. Since the aesthetic dimension is the causal dimension, what does this basic fact about what we do as literary scholars tell us about time itself? It tells us that the present isn't a bubble between past and future, or a blinking cursor, or a point. The present is a construct imposed on an uncanny intermeshing of appearance and essence. Presence is hollowed out from the inside by past and future. The meaning of a poem is in the future. This future is not a now point that is n now points away from the current one. It is withdrawn. It is withdrawal. That this future is what Derrida calls l'avenir, the to come, or what I call the future future. In a strict sense, Poetry does come from the future, just as Shelley argues. A weird Platonism is in effect, beaming the shadows of objects down from the future future into the central aesthetic co causal coexistence. The future future is not some transcendental beyond. This would be a top object par excellence, nor is the future future a time in which the object resides. The future future is the pure possibility of the object as such. The essence of a thing is the future. Withdrawal is futurality, not as a predictable time that is ontically given nor is futurality a post-structuralist excess, since this implies a thing for which the object is excessive. This could be a telescope or a tea bag, as much as it could be a human or a fish. Excess is an appearance belonging to the realm of an object's pastness, nor is futurality a void, a gap or empty nothingness. Perhaps the term openness expresses it best. Withdrawal is openness. Now we can discern more clearly the chorismos between essence and appearance. It's a rift between openness and pretense. An object persists and moves for as long as it can maintain its inner lie. If it's forced to speak nothing but the truth, destruction ensues, the rift collapses. Thus coexistence is inherently non-violent. It tolerates the rifting of as many things as possible, which means that it lets them exist. A thing is fragile not because it can be destroyed, but because the condition of this possibility of destruction is the very rift between essence and appearance. Destruction just is when something resonates with the inner wound, the hamartia of a thing, whatever that thing is. Um, Hamlet or a wine glass. When an opera singer sings just the right note attuned to the resonant frequency of the glass, it waves as if it were having an orgasm or a stroke, and the destroyed glass is nowhere to be seen, just as my own death is nowhere to be found in ontic given space. A rift is an aggravating thing, like that dissonant Tristan chord. A thing is fragile, unstable. DNA is a molecule that's trying to cancel itself out. Some inner disequilibrium moves it to erase the stain of itself from things, but in so doing it repeats itself. Don't we see here quite literally the fact that death comes before life? If you think DNA is alive, then you have stretched the definition of living to include things such as computer viruses and artificial life. For a start, what distinguishes a life form from non-life? Not very much. Life forms are made of non-life. For another thing, doesn't life consist in a frantic effort to get rid of the stain of itself all the way down to the DNA level, and indeed beyond, since RNA and other replicators predate DNA? What is called life, I have two pages, is just the expression of unstable molecules that contain some kind of inner disequilibrium. In their attempt to cancel themselves out, to solve their inner paradox, they ironically produce more of themselves.